Hi, everybody. Uh, nice to meet you all. And thank you to Stigamot and to Drifa for organizing this conference and for inviting me. Uh, I'm Kalle Berggren from Stockholm University. I have a background in sociology and gender studies. And over the last few years, I've been doing research on young men who have been violent against their girlfriends in the Swedish context. So today, um, my Icelandic is not so good, so um, I will speak English. Um, I will share some of the results from this project and some of the reflections um, um, concerning how we can think about those questions uh, with you. So the project that I have been working in, it was called uh, Parents and Friends Responses to Young Men's Intimate Partner Violence. And I've been doing this together with two of my colleagues, Professor Lucas Kutsen, who was the project leader, and also Hanna Bornas, who wrote her PhD thesis within this project. And it was funded by one of the largest Swedish research councils. So starting points for us were, um, we, we see ourselves as feminist researchers. So we're interested in questions about gender and power. Uh, norms of masculinity and those kinds of issues. But in this specific project, we were also interested in, in the question of youth and specifically focusing on young people, specifically young men who had been violent against their intimate female partners. So I would argue that um, youth is an important, but also to some degree, an overlooked category. I want to talk about uh, violence against women. So this is because of two reasons. First of all, we know from prevalence studies in Sweden, but also in other uh, contexts, that um, prevalence of intimate partner violence is highest among young people. So this is the age cohort where we see most of the violence, which means that we have uh, a lot of victims uh, that are young people, but also a lot of perpetrators. Uh, so if we want to address those issues, both in, in when we do research, but also practical work, I think it's really important to, to focus on young people and uh, how we can work to, to support them in various ways. But the other thing is also that uh, people in, in my age, um, it's very... And quite, it's quite unlikely that somebody of my age would one day uh, decide that, okay, now I'm going to turn into an abusive partner. So very often those things start uh, much earlier and then continue or, or not. So if we can address those things uh, early uh, with early interventions aimed at young people, then we can sort of uh, address violence against women um, in general as well. So therefore, I think that uh, focusing on, on young people is really a key key thing to to take into consideration when we talk about violence uh, in intimate relationships. Um, also, another starting point for this project was, um, I think some of you are probably familiar with this concept of the Nordic paradox, which means that when we talk about the Nordic countries, including Sweden, we often hear things as these are the most gender equal countries in the world. Uh, this is the best place in the world to live as a woman and so on. But on the other hand, we still have uh, quite high rates of, of violence in intimate relationships. So therefore, scholars have called this the Nordic paradox. OK, on the one hand, we're quite uh, gender equal. But on the other hand, there's still a lot of violence going on. So, so how can we think about this? So these are some of the starting points. Um, just I want to say a few brief uh, things about the study first, and then I will talk more about the results and and some more reflections. So what we done, what we did was uh, we've been doing a qualitative interview study. So we've been doing uh, in-depth interviews with perpetrators, with uh, off-Beldis men. Uh, and the participants in our study, there were uh, 14 uh, partner violent young men. Uh, we were looking to have people that were under 25, but it was really a challenge to find people that wanted to talk it up to be to talk about having used violence in intimate relationships. And uh, so we decided to also include some that were older, but were willing to share their experiences of having been uh, violent when they were younger. But part of the problem in finding people is also that nobody works with this group. So even though we know that uh, a lot of violence uh, is conducted uh, in youth intimate relationships, there's really, uh, in Sweden, no organization uh, that really focuses on, on uh, young people who have been violent. So, so when we talk about men's violence against women, we often tend to think about older men, adult men that are using violence. And when we talk about youth violence, 
we often think about other kinds of violence, for instance, young men who beat each other at the pub or at the football match or something like that. So there's really been a gap uh, and nobody has been working with, with this group. I'm not really sure how the situation is in Iceland, but at least in Sweden, uh, we know that this is a key group from research, but nobody has really been working with this group. So therefore, it's been quite difficult to find people as well to, who wanted to participate in the research project. But we, we did uh, find some and we have 14 interviews. Um, and they, the people that per agreed to participate in our study, they were all heterosexual. Uh, some of them came from migrant families, but most of them belonged to the white majority Swedish population. Uh, they came from both working class and middle class backgrounds, so relatively diverse background of people. Uh, I have two things that I want to talk about from this project. The first is um, the social, what we call social network responses. So we think it's important not only to think about these people as um, isolated individuals, but also think about how they are um, part of a social context uh, where they have um, important relationships that are also playing its part in, in the violence and its aftermath. So in previous research on youth intimate partner violence, there has been this discussion about young people, they often um, live at home with their parents or they often go to school. So there are often adults that are somehow present uh, in their life, um, hopefully supporting the young people, but also to some degree monitoring what's going on. So often there are key adult persons that uh, uh, tend to know quite a bit about what's going on in the lives of young people. And when it comes to violent relationships, uh, those people can act as uh, uh, bridges to ending violence, or they can um, sometimes be more of a barrier to ending violence. So it's really important what, what the adult people around the young people, uh, how they interpret things, and uh, if they are willing to ask questions, to interfere sometimes, and to, to have suggestions for, for what can be done. Um, also, in research on young men and masculinity, there has been a lot of discussions about uh, how, how and why individual young men come to adopt norms of masculinity. Um, and there has been a lot of concepts and discussions um, such as gender policing or, or so on. So gender policing means that um, maybe it's not so easy to be a young man in these uh, peer groups where there can be quite a narrow idea of how you should behave as a, as a man. Uh, so it's quite restrictive in that sense, but it can also have consequences for how those young men relate to other people, uh, particularly girlfriends and other women. So uh, maybe it's in those peer groups that young men learn uh, entitlement, they're entitled to, to get some things from, from young women. Uh, and one of the uh, concepts of this has been like pro-abuse peer support. And um, there's actually quite few theories about masculinity and violence against women, um, specifically. Of course, there are the broader theories that we live in, in a patriarchal, uh, unequal society, and that uh, is sort of a, is a cause of why we see this violence, but there's quite few theories that were specifically address questions about masculinity and, and violence against women. And one of those theories that we do have was um, developed by two Canadian criminologists, and it's called male peer support theory. And basically what this theory is saying is that they have sort of a, a model of um, what factors influence uh, violence. So they have this model. We have um, here two people that are in a dating relationship, as they say in, in, the, in North America. And then um, maybe... the they don't know exactly how to deal with the situations that arise. Uh, they feel some level of stress. And if I am a young man in this relationship, I feel a bit stressed. I don't know how to do it. I go to my male um, friends and ask for support. And in some cases, the support that I give is quite problematic. It's quite toxic. And maybe the friends will tell me some, something like, um, OK, but you need to be the boss in this relationship. Or, uh, of course, if you paid for, for dinner, then you have a right to sex or something like that. So, so the theory says that often uh, there can be those sort of um, uh, toxic messages or, or pro-abusive male peer support that sort of uh, can be an important factor in which young men then use violence against women. Um, but this is uh, primarily based on quantitative survey data from, from North America, from Canada, and from the US. So we were interested to see, is this something that um, can be seen also in the Swedish context, contemporary? Um, 
And then we would expect uh, perhaps that in the interviews we would see a lot of this, what we call uh, unmitigated support for violence. Maybe we would, when we interviewed those perpetrators, maybe we would hear a lot of stories about how their male friends were giving them toxic messages and so on. But um, to our surprise, we, we didn't see any of that uh, in our data. So we, we have no evidence of, of that. Uh, as we will see, there are some more mixed messages, but we didn't find any evidence of those, um, um, those really explicit sexist uh, violence supporting uh, attitudes. And maybe this is also connected to this Nordic paradox that um, uh, even the perpetrators and the social networks are sort of officially against partner violence because everybody is now uh, for gender equality to some degree and, and against violence, which makes it quite interesting, I think. Um, we, what did the social networks do if they weren't encouraging violence? Um, we saw some examples of the opposite, uh, where they were actually condemning violence. So this is um, a quote from one of the participants in our study uh, that we call Christopher, and he had... Um, he had used sexual violence against his first girlfriend during a couple of years and then the relationship ended and the social network found out about this and then they weren't exactly happy about this. So, so he recalls it like this. Um, well, it was really tough. It was hard on me. I was fired from my band, he was playing in, in a music band, and lost about 10 to 15 friends who jointly decided to well, exclude me from the circle of friends. They, some of them wrote a number of um, public social media posts saying that I was a woman hater and that if, if I read this, I should watch my back. They were going to keep track of which events I was going to and were threatening me in some way so I wouldn't be able to make new friends. So rather than supporting violence, we can see uh, some instances where the social network instead condemns violence, and in this case also condemns the person, not only the violent acts, but also the person. And therefore many of the men that we have interviewed were quite reluctant to tell their friends about the violence because they were expecting um, um, this sort of condemnation and maybe that they should be losing friends if, if anybody found out and so on. Um, we also have examples of more mixed messages, and we call this um, more ambiguous responses. So these are um, responses from the social network that are not either clearly supporting the violence or not clearly um, uh, condemning it. So in this case, we have um, Martin, 24, and he, they were in his apartment, it was he, uh, it was his girlfriend and some of the friends, and Martin and his girlfriend had an argument about who should, doing, who should be doing the cooking and cleaning, and he hit her. Um, so, but they were having this fight, but there were also the friends who were there and witnessing the event. And when he talks about it, he says that, my friends, they, they didn't think it was a good idea to use violence. So they were clearly uh, against the violence, but at the same time, they said that she's difficult to deal with. They understood me, which is sick. They understood me. Everybody I've been talking to has understood me. So there's this really mixed message. On the one hand, of course, violence is wrong. But on the other hand, in this particular circumstances, uh, maybe there was something that she did that provoked, or, or she's a difficult person, or, or whatever. So uh, this we can see more of. So we didn't see the explicit uh, sexist, uh, pro-abusive attitudes, but we saw more of these uh, mixed, mixed messages in the data. Um, we also had some examples of what we call a more um, change-oriented or transformative responses, which are much more uh, what we want to see. Um, the people in the social network sort of seek to end the violence and find ways to support them and to stop using violence. And this, uh, sometimes uh, the parents can act as those um, bridges to, to ending violence. And in this case, we have Andreas, 22 years, and he says that, I have never had any self-awareness to change myself except for this with my mom because my mom had figured out that it was wrong what I was doing. This situation where I grabbed my girlfriend, then my mom said, maybe it's best for you to start going to an anti-violence organization. Uh, they can help you. So it's really important that we have those interventions, people um, who observe what's going on and are um, prepared to make an intervention when, when that is needed. So often this can be mothers, but it doesn't have to be. Um, we saw some examples of this happening also between uh, young men themselves. So Gustav, he says, um, I have this friend, uh, he has big aggression issues, 
um, and he doesn't feel well. So I recommended that he consult an anti-violence organization and that that is something that he ought to try. And in relation to that, I talked a bit, a little bit about my own problems with using violence too. So in this case, uh, also uh, this can be something that goes on between young men that they can also help each other um, to, to find ways to stop using violence in intimate relationships, which was um, interesting, but also quite surprising given this theory that uh, has said that uh, young men tend to encourage each other to use violence against women. So, so um, we think it's really important to think about those uh, social network responses, but also to think about that they can, um, uh, they can really be quite different um, and it doesn't have to be one way or the other. So violence is not just something that is private and hidden, but friends and family often learn about the abuse, even if the perpetrators try to, try to limit this and try to make sure that not so many people knew, uh, know about it. There are often some key persons that know about it, so how they respond is very crucial. So. Uh, it's really important then that the social network um, is sort of aware, so they recognize those situations and can act in a, in a good way. Uh, and this, I think this is also something that is increasingly recognized when we talk about work, uh, which is more into violence prevention. For instance, in Sweden, there is this program Mentors in Violence Prevention, which was developed in the United States and then it has been translated and adopted and is currently used in some Swedish schools uh, and has this focus on bystanders. So how do we talk with young people about these questions? Maybe if we talk about them as potential victims or as potential perpetrators, then they might become a bit defensive. So maybe it's better if we address them like um, we're all part of this community and we can all be active by bystanders and that can sort of make a difference in, in those risky situations and so on. So, and some of my colleagues have been evaluating this program in Sweden and, and there's really mixed results. So sometimes it works really good and sometimes it's, um, if, the, if the teachers that are supposed to deliver this program, if they aren't um, properly educated in how to do it, maybe it can sometimes be a bit um, problematic as well. So, but uh, this, is, this emphasis on the social network is just something that we see across several, several research discussions about young men's uh, violence against women. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is um, uh, what I call subjective change. Um, when we talk about qualitative research with perpetrators, um, there has been, now simplifying a little bit, but there's been like two main questions that researchers have asked. And the first is, how do boys and men talk about their use of violence? And then we have a lot of evidence from different studies that perpetrators, they tend to justify the violence. Um, it was nothing wrong with it. They minimized the severity. It wasn't that bad. They minimized the frequency. It was only that one time. They downplayed their responsibility. They blamed the victims and so on. So that's why we always need to be a bit careful when we talk about or work with perpetrators that we just, uh, we, we can't just buy what they're saying uh, because often there's a lot of these things going on. Uh, so that's the case both for people working with, with uh, perpetrators in a more practical way, but also for us as, as researchers. And um, we found some of this in our data. Uh, our participants, they were sometimes minimizing their responsibility and, and so on, but uh, it was not their main, it was not the main thing in our interview, in, in, in our interviews. Um, they did it to some extent, but more often they were actually condemning intimate partner violence, which is uh, interesting. Um, the other question that scholars have asked is, uh, to paraphrase uh, Simone de Beauvoir, we can say that uh, one is not born a violent man, but rather becomes one. So how is it that some men end up as violent men? And then scholars have been doing uh, life history interviews with men who have been violent and see what was it in the past that caused them to, to that made them become those violent men. And often um, there's a combination of having been exposed to violence, bullying, harassment and school at school and um, in combination with uh, more toxic or uh, um, not so good messages about masculine, masculine norms. And for instance, if a young man is harassed at school and then he goes back home and asks his father, okay, how should I respond to this question? And the father says, well, you have to, you have to fight back, you have to hit back. Then there's quite a risk that this young man will turn into a violent man. Um, but when we look at our interviews, um, we were thinking about what were going on in those interviews and 
we asked another question, which was, um, how does the process of changing from violence, what does that process look like? And um, we found some clues in our interviews. Uh, so one of the things that we found was that um, there is an impact of, of the public discussions, the public discourse that we're having. Um, so let's uh, go back to Christopher, who you met a bit earlier. And in his first relationship with his girlfriend, he sort of uh, pressured or um, coerced or nagged her into having sex. So he describes this as, as um, uh, this, this is a specific word in Swedish, short sex, which is sort of a nagging sex or pressurized sex. And we asked him in an interview, when and how did you start to think about this as nagging sex or started to think about it in another way? And he says that, when was it that people started talking about nagging sex? Wasn't it, maybe it was a year after the relationship ended, around 2015, 2014. When it was brought up in public debate, then I realized what I had done. During the actual relationship, I thought about it a few times, but not often at all. I thought more that I should be like a real man who sleeps with his girlfriend. And then afterwards, I came to understand that this was a matter of nagging sex. So two things here. Um, first, it was quite um, common in our data that those men said that they didn't think about it as violence back then. They, they were just dealing with the situations, they were solving some problems, they were making sure that they had sex or whatever. And then something happens and it's much later that they realize, oh, maybe this was violence, maybe now I'm a sexual offender, maybe now I'm a violent man, but they didn't really think about it in that way at the time. And the other thing is this, um, uh, he makes these specific references to the public debate in 2014, 2015, and actually there was a feminist campaign in Sweden. This was before Me Too. Uh, the campaign was focused on, on sexual gray zones. It was a, not a very extended debate, but it was quite some debate uh, a few months. Uh, so this made people aware of those, and it was sort of a new, this new word, short sex, uh, nagging sex, that was established and so on. So we often tend to think about those feminist um, campaigns, feminist debates as offering new, new possibilities for victims to uh, make sense of their experiences. But this also shows that uh, those words and, and, and campaigns and public discussions can also have an impact on how, how perpetrators come to interpret their experiences. Um, they, the people that we interviewed, they were also talking about um, their parents and their childhood. So we were asking them about and the violence that they had committed against their girlfriends uh, and, and so on, but they also wanted to talk about their, 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 their parents and their upbringing. And Bjorn, 25, he says that, uh, because when I was small, I was beaten by my oldest brother as a disciplinary measure. And then when I talked to my mom, I found out that my dad hit both me and my oldest brother. And then I found out that my granddad beat my grandmom. So it was like, yeah, maybe there's a reason why you're completely wrong in the head. Uh, similarly, Gustav, he told us that I want to try to sort out what has happened to the family, what is happening to the family, and sort of take my share of it and say that it's not just that who's got problems, I have them too. So they are sort of making those connections between the violence they have committed against their girlfriends and the violence they, that was present during their upbringing and that they were exposed to as children. And psychologists have often uh, talked about this in terms of intergenerational transmission of violence and a cycle of violence, but the point that we want to make here is that um, we think that for those young men that we have interviewed, violence goes from something that was more naturalized and normalized. They didn't think about it as violence. And when they start to think about violence, then they can ask themselves those questions. Okay, but why did I uh, become this violent man? And, and then they can say, okay, but maybe, uh, uh, maybe it has something to do with my, my dad or the, the other adult man in my family and, and so on. Um, and they also, um, I mentioned this before, but one of the other things is that they begin to see the violence as violence. And here we have uh, uh, Emil, um, who says that in our relationship, I have made many unreasonable demands uh, against my girlfriend. Pathetically unreasonable, that is. And when you sit down and tell somebody else, then you hear for yourself how idiotic it sounds. And he goes on to talk about these things and he says that uh, it's really obvious stuff often that in a relationship you have to be on the same level. 
There can't be one person ruling over the other and stuff like that. These are very obvious things for me, but in practice, it hasn't been that obvious. So this, um, this last sentence, I found it quite interesting because this is sort of the, the Nordic paradox uh, embodied, isn't it? So even the perpetrators are against intimate partner violence. Uh, it's obvious to be against violence, but in practice, it hasn't been that obvious. So, so the task for us is not only to to make sure that people have better ideologies, but it's also to work with like the pra practical ways of dealing with, with different situations. Uh, thank you for listening, and if you want to read more, here are some of the publications that came out of the project uh, where you can find this analysis. Thank you so much, Kalle. Uh, we have no time for a one question, I think. <laughs> uh, Santis Anna is here with the microphone somewhere. So if you have one question, uh, but maybe it's better to leave it to the discuss discussions afterwards. What I took very strongly from your lecture is that um, uh, the public debate actually made violent young men think. So this is something that we really have to take from this conference, all of us, isn't it? Thank you.